Hey folks, I am Becky with Enduring Finances. Welcome back to our channel. Today we are continuing on to follow up with a video I did a couple weeks ago that talked about the future of Lime and how they are transitioning from using their traditional juicers into logistics partners. And we're going to talk about how you can apply and go through the steps to become a logistics partner with Lime. And then the next video, I will break down kind of the cost scenarios of what that looks like and what your business model might focus on, whether that's contractors or traditional employees. But for this video, we're just going to be taking a look at how you would go about applying to become a logistics partner and what you would need to have in order to do that. Now, logistics partners handle the day-to-day -day operations of charging, deploying, retrieving batteries and scooters and bikes in various cities around the world. Some cities with Lime use just specifically logistics partners in their teams, some use only juicers, the traditional juicers, and some have a hybrid model where they mix both of them together. One keynote is logistics partners are very similar to the fleet managers that Bird uses, but they differ because Bird fleet managers handle the repairs and they usually have a set number of scooters that are theirs specifically, exclusively, and Lime doesn't do that. The logistics partners typically don't handle the repairs and they don't have, unless they're an exclusive market, they don't have all the scooters fall underneath them. So there can be comp competition within the market itself depending on how many logistics partners or juicers are still operating in that area. Now, most logistics partners operate a small business with either contract employees, like the traditional juicers that are out today, except for California, or they have standard common law employees that work underneath them, which are like hourly. In cities where the generation four scooters and bikes are with interchangeable batteries, a large charging location like a warehouse or a garage might not be required. And that's because typically those batteries are going to be charged in the Lime's warehouse itself, where they're doing the repairs and all of the change out and swap outs, all of that. In areas where there's an exclusive logistic partner, meaning there's only one and they own that market share completely, they might, Lime might want them to have their own warehouse space to charge those batteries and to hold those scooters, depending on the location but it kind of depends on that. And most logistics partners are not gonna be exclusive to a market area. So let's break down what you need in order just to apply to become a logistics partner with Lime. Now Lime has changed these requirements a little bit and I'm expecting to see some changes in the future. So this is where it's at right now in August of 2022. So the first thing is you have to be registered as a formal business entity. Typically an LLC or a corporation is gonna be that. You're going to have to have at least general liability business insurance that covers your ability to function and not, you know, lose an arm and a leg if you wreck a vehicle. You're going to have access to a fleet of vehicles. This is a new change that Lime's implemented. So access to a fleet of vehicles doesn't say own, but says access. You have to be able to manage staff or what they're calling sub accounts, like the juicers that work underneath you to complete tasks. And then of course you have to adhere and meet all of the state and federal local labor laws and business laws. And for California, that's a big thing. So if you already own and operate a similar business, maybe you have limousines or do some type of ride share service, you're not gonna have to jump through a lot of this initial hurdles that new business owners are going to have. If you don't already have an existing business, there's gonna be more risk involved, especially in the startup process, because you could go all the way through and jump through all these steps and not be selected by Lime and just lose money and time. So to, to apply, if you're not currently a juicer, it's very straightforward. You can go to Lime's website, I'll link it below in the description, and fill out your information. They're going to ask basic information like your name, your contact information, like your email, your phone number, your business name, and the location that you're looking to operate in. And they're going to set it up, they're going to have you read through a contract and sign that, and then typically the local area manager or the hiring manager for your region is going to be the one that connects with you after the fact to kind of approve or disapprove, interview, all those things on the back end. But it could be weeks or even months before you hear anything back from Lime if they're not advertising an opening in that location. If you're a current juicer, it's a little bit more complicated because you already have an account set up with Lime. So even if you were to go to the Lime's website and try and apply to be a logistics partner, they're going to ding you and say an error because you already have an account active with them. So in that instance, you would either need to have a new phone number and email address, maybe with your business, set up 
to apply as a new account or you're going to need to work with your local area manager or the warehouse whoever's running that to kind of coordinate with them and do it on the back end to apply and go through it that way um, the most common way that i have heard from people being transitioning into the logistics partner role from being a user is when Lime has reached out to them directly and said, hey, you're doing great in this area, you're really consistent, you're a high task person, like we would like to consider you to fill this role if you're willing to step up and start this business and go through these steps. And so that's the most common way that I'm hearing of juicers transitioning to logistics partners. A great starting point if that is your situation where you are a juicer and want to be a logistics partner is to link up with the local warehouse to get a contact information for either your area manager or the hiring manager for your area and work through it that way. Let's take a closer look at what you need to do in order to meet the minimum requirements that Lime is outlining for this. If you are looking to start your business, the first thing you're going to have to do is decide what type of business structure is going to be best for you in this business area. When it comes to starting business, there's some pretty common business structures like a sole proprietorship, a partnership where that's limited liability or not, a limited liability in LLC company, or a corporation or four of the most common ones that you've probably heard of. And there's variations of these, specifically the partnership and the corporations that we won't expand on because this will just keep it brief. But a sole proprietorship is what I have with my own business. I'm a single owner. There's no separation of my assets and my liabilities between my business stuff and my personal finances. So they're all in one joint account and I handle managing it through Excel on the back end to make sure I'm tracking the money effectively. And I don't have it registered as a formal business entity because I'm not required to at this stage. With a partnership, a partnership is between two or more people. So you could have two or three partners in it and it breaks it down where you could have unlimited liability for one partner and the rest have limited liability or they can all have limited liability between all of the partners which kind of creates a safety net between what you do versus what your partner may do in error and the legal obligations required with debts and liabilities and that. Um, a limited liability company in LLC is probably the most common that you're going to see and hear about. Um, it is a company that separates the liability from the business and the owner. So it creates a, a division down there as far as assets and liabilities and it creates a safety net with that. And it also has tax benefits that a corporation doesn't have and it, that is it's only taxed once. So it's only taxed for what is paid out to the owners and the employees of that company. And then corporations. Now there's different specifications on corporations, we won't get into that. The blanket approach is that a, a company that offers the most protection for the owners as far as liability and separation of assets between owners and the company. And the biggest takeaway from that is that the company is taxed twice. So it's taxed on the earnings, the profits that the company makes, and then it's taxed again a second time on when it pays out the owners and the employees or the shareholders after the fact. So it's taxed twice. The most common way that you're probably going to see logistics partners run is through an LLC because it gives you the best of both worlds. It's like a bridge between a sole proprietorship and a corporation. And it's a great strategy because it protects the owner from liability for any accidents that might happen or whatever happens on that back end. So it keeps you safe but you don't get taxed double like a corporation does. And so an LLC is kind of like the middle ground that's probably going to be the best way and the most common way to start out in a logistics partner role. So once you decide what kind of business structure you're going to want to run, you're going to have to choose a business name. Now this could take a while and it could be hard for you to think of something. I know it took me quite a while to narrow down on my name. I spent days with, I can't say it, a thetharis going through and writing down different variations of something that I felt wanted it that I felt fit what I wanted to portray and then I was bouncing it off my brother like for days I was like this name or this name or this name until I narrowed in on the one so I would say take your time and don't rush into the first thing that pops in your head unless like it's absolutely perfect then you're going to need to go ahead and register your business now this typically ta costs about 110 to 150 dollars to register your business on the state level and it just varies on what type of business you're doing and what state specifically that you're looking at registering in. 
Different states have, of course, different processes on how they do it. Some states will allow you to register online completely, or some will require you to go in person and complete documents in the local state. The documents that you need is gonna depend on what type of business structure that you're going with. So a partnership, you're gonna have a certificate of partnership, a partnership agreement for an LLC, for an LLC, you're gonna have articles of organization and an LLC operating agreement. And then for a corporation, you're gonna have articles of incorporation and bylaws or resolutions. So there's three different various sections that you can have. Um, generally, you're gonna to have to go through a state specific registered agent to handle all of the legal documents and paperwork on your company's behalf. Uh, the biggest resource that I can give you is the U.S. Small Business Administration website, and I will link that down below as well. It is a great resource that allows you to filter by state on how you, can, how you need to register and what specific documents you will need to provide. So that would be a great starting point for anybody that's looking to start a business is the U.S. Small Business Administration website. And again, I will link that down below in the description for you to look at. So once you've registered your business, you're going to have to apply for your business's federal tax ID number. And this number is also known as the employer identification number, the EIN which is, you can look at it similar to a individual social security number. It's just an identification number that the government can use to help track with taxes and maintaining like documents and bank accounts and all of that stuff. And the IRS has a great tool to allow you and assist you to apply for that. It's very easy, it's free, it doesn't cost any money. And their tool is called the EIN Assistant. And I will link how to get to that assistant in the description as well and it can be found at irs.gov if you just search for EIN assistance and it walks you through step by step how to apply and what information you need to plug in which is all of your business information and it's pretty straightforward. Following up with taxes, um, some states like Alaska and Texas don't have a local state tax but most, I think there was like seven, but most states in the United States do have some sort of in state income tax that you have to pay. So if you have, if you live in a state or your business is going to be residing in a state that does have income tax, you're going to have to apply for a state tax ID number as well. And again, each state is different with that and they have different processes and procedures on what you need to do with that. It is again free for most states. Um, I recommend again the U.S. Small Business Administration website. It helps, it has a tool that breaks down different states and what the process is or what location or website or point of contact you need to apply for that in each state. And I will again have that link down below in the description for you to take a look at. So once you've got your business registered and you've gotten your tax ID numbers, then you're going to go ahead and need to, as long as it's an LLC or corporation, open a business bank account specifically. I, that's going to be the best approach, especially if you're having employees underneath you, is have a separation between you and the company itself so that you have a layer of protection. There are a lot of banks and financial institutions out there, and they're going to be very eager to work with you because they're going to make money off of fees from you. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you take the time and survey all of the options that you have and keep a very big eye on the fees and make sure that you're getting the best deal that you can find with the least amount of fees that meets the needs of your personal business and your strategy. It's important to remember those small fees, even if they're 10 cents a transaction, will add up to a large amount over time the more transactions that you have. Another requirement from Lime is to have general liability insurance for your company, and that's like the bare minimum of insurance. There's more extensive coverage that you can purchase if that suits you and you have money in the budget to do that, but at the bare minimum, you're gonna need general liability insurance that's going to help protect you and your business from being sued, and if there's an accident in a vehicle or damage done, it protects you, and it's a very good coverage to have. It costs on average about $40 to $55 a month for that, and again, there are different um, insurance providers out there, and you're gonna want to wine and dine them and make sure that you're getting the best deal that you can in your market that meets the needs of your business. So take your time and evaluate all of your options as far as that. I know that 
some logistics partners, especially if they're an exclusive partner operating solely in an area, might be required by line to have more expansive, expensive, yeah, expansive um, insurance coverage, specifically if they have a warehouse where they're holding batteries and not using Lime's warehouse, they might need additional coverage to support that. But that's going to be based specifically off of Lime and what they're wanting from you. So get the bare minimum of the uh, general liability insurance to start with and you can always increase or decrease your coverage as needed working with that insurance company. Now Lime specifies that you need to have access to a fleet of vehicles. I think an important takeaway from that is you do not have to own a fleet of vehicles. You just have to have access to, which is kind of vague in my opinion, which is a good thing. And one of the things that I do like about how it articulates on Lime's website is it doesn't state that it has to be a truck or a cargo van. It states it can be a van or a truck or a bike or even a trailer that you can attach to your bike and pull around. So you have options on that. Don't feel like you have to go and buy a second vehicle or even, you know, a first vehicle just to do this. You could apply with, I could apply with my truck and a bicycle that I have and still meet the access to a fleet of vehicles. As you build your business up and you expand and maybe bring on more employees or contractors, you can look at expanding your fleet as well, depending on what your business model looks like and how it's all flowing. But at the very beginning, you don't need to worry about that. And then the last real big thing is the ability to manage and bring on sub accounts and workers underneath you, essentially. Lime has been a little bit vague about this in the beginning. At first they were kind of like, you need three. Now they're not specifying a number of workers that you need at the time of applying. It simply states on the website, most currently, is the ability to hire sub-accounts. So anybody in, anybody in the world has the ability to hire people to work underneath them as long as you follow all the business structures and have everything else in place. So you don't need to be stressed about coming on board with three people that are set up and ready to rock and roll and then just playing the waiting game to hear back from Lime. It's going to be up to the individual logistics partner to determine if they want to hire someone as an employee or as an independent contractor. Unless you're in California and then California's laws specifically break down that these juicers fall underneath employees and not independent contractors. But that's the only state right now that is specifying that. Um, so you can make the decision based on where you're at and your business model if you want to hire as employees or if you want to hire as independent contractors. And you have the option to kind of wait to see if you get picked up by line before you make that decision on how you want to go. When you start looking for people to hire or considering who you might want to pull in as workers, um, current and past users would be my first go-to. They have experience, they're already involved in it, they know the area, and they have an idea of how they're going to work that into their schedule if they already have another job. Or college students are a good option, especially if you're based on a campus. Those would be great options. And then people that are just looking for flexible work would be a good place to start when you're considering looking at who you could hire. I think it's important to keep in mind that even if you already have a business coming into this or you're a new business owner as a logistics partner, no one's going to come in and have all their ducks in a row and have all the vehicles they need and all the employees they need ready to start when they apply. And I don't think Lime is expecting that anymore. I think they've eased up a little bit on their requirements to make that ease easier to enter their market space. And so don't rush the process and buy a fleet of vehicles, go out and buy like three or four vans and hire a bunch of people if you haven't been approved by Lime. Because we know that Lime has not been the greatest at communicating changes and updates and all those things, they're not. And what I'm seeing from people talking about it online, in forums and different groups on Facebook, that they are taking weeks and sometimes months before they hear back from Lime when they've applied for these logistics partners positions. So it could be a hot minute before you get approved to start entering the market space and actually completing tasks and seeing a profit. So you want to be really careful that one, you know this is something that you want to do and two, that you have the ability to not jump in right away and not go under. So you don't you have a safety net essentially. You have a safety net in place to protect you in case Lyme does not approve you for a long time or they don't approve you at all. So I think that's a good baseline on how to 
put your application in and get your foot in the door with Lime and wait to hear back from them and just play the waiting game. My next video, because it's a long, this is, this is going to be a long video. My last video was like over 20 minutes just talking about the transition of Lime. So my next video, I want to break down different cities and different business models that you could choose and the costs associated with those and kind of look at the pros and cons of what you could expect to see as far as startup costs and employee costs and profit returns based off different scenarios and kind of show my thought process of how that works and what kind of a return you could expect to see and if it's actually something that you want to pursue in your area. Um, but yeah, I think that wraps it up. Hopefully this answers the initial question of how you go about applying to become a logistics partner. So let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns in the comment section below, or you can email me, or you can reach out any way, shape, or form on any of my social media platforms, and I will try my best to help you and answer you. I will say, if you if you message me on Instagram, I'm probably going to be slow. I'm very bad about responding to those because I get spammed a lot. But I will try my best to answer your questions and give you as much help as I can. So I will see you next time, guys. Thank you.